I'm Dina Nelson, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Recreational crabbing is enjoyed by thousands of people in our state. To keep this activity alive and well, we must apply good resource management as well as good conservation practices. The basic management strategy of Puget Sound Dungeness Crab is what we call the 3S management, and that's a size restriction, a sex restriction, which is males only in a season. And the season is established around not fishing when crab are in their soft shell stage. The sex restriction is males only can be taken in the fishery and the size is males only that are six and a quarter inches or larger. Those are the primary management rules or strategies, if you will, in managing the Puget Sound fishery. And on top of that, what we set are regional management area quotas each year. The bottom one is a female crab, the top one is a male crab. It's a lot wider on the on the pyramid, basically on the bottom of the crab, it gets really wide here. The male stays narrow all the way up to a pyramid. And uh, another thing in the state of Washington, um, to be a legal crab, it's not supposed to be a soft shell crab. And one way to tell if it is a soft shell crab is you take the front pincher and you push, and if it squeezes together like this one is, this crab's a little soft. It'll be mostly a saltwater taste, won't have much meat in it. And when you can't push that together, that's a very hard crab, which is a, a very edible crab. And let's try this one. This one I can't pinch together at all. This one has a lot of meat in it. So that would be, a legal crab as far as softness goes if it was a male. In, the, in Washington state you have to have a rot away cord which this is the opening where you're gonna this string is designed to rot away within a couple of weeks if this pot is lost at sea and this door will open and all the crabs can escape. It has to have rot away cord on the door and then you have to have a four and a quarter inch escape pod and this is the string, it's a cotton string that's tied on here that's designed to rot in the way. The escape hole is four and a quarter inches. Every pot has to have these so the smaller crab can get out and you're not you know, molesting the smaller crab. They can actually escape, come and go as they please because you're not after the small ones anyway. These are the marine areas or the management areas that the department has established in Puget Sound and each year we establish harvest quotas for each marine area in cooperation with the Puget Sound Treaty Tribes. Those quotas are set before the season starts and the quotas are, are basically divided into shares for the three user groups that fish on Dungeness Crab in Puget Sound. That would be the treaty tribes getting a share. The, the state allocates a certain amount of crab in each marine area to recreational fishing and some to commercial fishing. The Dungeness Crab Recreational Catch Record Card is the tool that is used by the department for estimating both in-season harvest as well as a final season harvest for the recreational fishery. It's a, a system that is, is very simple, but I cannot stress enough how important it is for the recreational fishers to report their catch on the catch card both accurately and if they're part of the survey that we do in season through a telephone to have their catch card in front of them and report that catch. It is the tool that we use for setting season lengths for the recreational fishery in the future and judging the status of the resource in Puget Sound. Smelt dipping is an activity that many people look forward to every winter in western Washington. And while it hasn't been a very good year for harvest, smelt fans aren't giving up. For decades, um, people have been coming down to southwest Washington to 
go out uh, and fish from the bank and catch their limit of uh, Columbia River smelt. These are anadromous fish in the 8 to 10 inch size range. Uh, they can fill up a, a limit um, on big runs. That limit can be up as to 25 pounds, which essentially fills a five gallon bucket. During periods when the runs are small and when we need to manage more conservatively, we reduce the limit to 10 pounds, which might be a quarter to a third of a bucket full. On years when the smelt are extremely abundant, a person can get a 25 pound limit in two or three dips. It can be that, that fantastic. And it turns out people are disappointed. They've driven all this way and suddenly they have their limit. <laughs> smelt are very important as a forage fish for ocean fish such as salmon, whatnot. Once, they're, um, re once they return to freshwater to spawn, they end up being very important to the sturgeon population down here in the lower Columbia River. They're as small um, juvenile fish out in the ocean. They're fed upon as adults out in the ocean. Once they leave the Columbia, they go both north and south, particularly north. There's actually spawning smelt populations all along the west coast. The most recent uh, genetic information we have suggests that, at least off the northern Washington Canadian area, we've got three somewhat distinct populations. It's important for marine birds. It's important for marine mammals as they, um, as, again, as they enter the fresh water. We've counted 10 different species of gulls concentrating on the, and feeding on these fish in, in shallower waters moving up, for instance, the Cowlitz River. It's very, very important for the, the seal population. The timing of the uh, movement of seals and sea lions into the Columbia. It is the easy fishery. You don't need sophisticated gear. You don't need a boat. You, you get them from the shore. Best way to catch smelt is either early in the morning or late afternoon when the sun's not on the water. They tend to move in closer to the shore. Uh, you need a long pole, a uh, smelt net, but you want to find a, a spot where the river makes a bend, um, where there's kind of a trough off the shore. Start feeling your way out. Work from the bank outward. Uh, as more sun hits the water, you want to keep moving further and further out because the fish will continue moving further and further out. As you're, as you're walking out, uh, you notice that I was using the end of my pole uh, to kind of feel my way out. Uh, Cowlitz River is, is murky from Mount St. Helens blown. It's real silty. Uh, so you can't see the bottom. So using your pole to walk your way out uh, is best because there are ledges out there. It'll be two, three feet deep and then just drop straight off. Oh, well, fun is you never, never know how, how many you're going to get. Uh, you, can, you can dip for a while and catch nothing or you can dip and get your 10 pounds in one dip. In good years I've seen that done. Come down here and dip and, and uh, fill your bucket with one, uh, one scoop. But, you know, you never know what you're going to get. One, twelve, it's fun to bring the kids down, bring the family down. Uh, they're good eating, smoked, fried. Uh, they're also good sturgeon bait. Washington offers fishing opportunities year-round, and here are some for the next few weeks. WDFW is a part of a cost share program for small forest landowners to improve fish passage. The purpose of the family forest plan is to improve salmon streams. However, we're finding that while it's good for fish, it also may help family tree farms stay in the family. 
actually this is starting 118 years since my great great grandparents homesteaded here in this valley and um, Tim and his sisters are the fifth generation to be here on the land. People that grow up here love the land. You know, stewardship was a part of their lives before stewardship became a buzzword that when you grow up loving the land, you want to take care of it, you want to do the right things. And I really think that that's the way most small forest landowners feel. People want to do what's good for the land. They want to protect streams. They want to enhance um, fish passage. But it's really hard coming up with the money to do that. So um, I would say our family's been good stewards for a long, long time before it even became fashionable. And our hope is to pass it on to this next generation to continue what his great, great, great grandparents did. <laughs> it's a great place to be. And you know, I really enjoy you know, taking whatever part I can. You know, it's, it's kind of minimal at, at this point, but you know, I'd, I've always, you know, dreamed of just continuing the, the legacy down here, you know, and involving my sisters as well and just doing whatever I can to keep it in the family. So. It enhances everybody's life, you know, the salmon. To be able to see them come back up here, you know, this is where it started with salmon. Uh, anything we can do, you know, like planting double wide buffer zones or um, we just uh, put 57 acres in a CREP program to enhance uh, the streamside zones. Anything we can do that'll help salmon move back and forth um, so that it's, it's still just a part of, of our natural resource base in the state of Washington, I think we need to do. And that's what this, this program helps so that uh, any usable habitat can be uh, you know, found by those salmon. You know, this one opened up two extra miles at least of habitat above stream. Our responsibility as good stewards is not to just think about what are we taking from the land, but you also contribute back to it. And um, the fish are one part of that cycle that um, we have a responsibility to protect them and the trees and also balance that with um, our livelihood. And I think that's one of the big challenges is being aware of that, that you don't just take everything from the land, that you return in due season um, the gifts that you've received. And Tim likes to, <laughs> he likes to be out in the yard practicing his casting. <laughs> well, yeah, from a recreation standpoint. <laughs> and what happens here impacts people in Tacoma and Seattle and Spokane because maybe they do want to go to the store and buy some fish, fresh or frozen, and, and there's folks out of Raymond and out of South Bend that, that have fishing boats out of Westport and Ilwaco, and you know, those, who knows which salmon start where, but they could easily come from here out there, and yeah, we, we do have this, this tree farm, but it takes care of, um, it takes care of a lot more people, a lot more places um, than any of us really realize. Here's where you can see some of Washington's wildlife. Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.